right with optics. You have to have a stable platform. On Earth, it's the Earth. In space, it's a satellite. Uh, uh, and the, the uh, structure that holds it together. You have to hold the secondary away from the primary. It has to be very stiff. It can't shake in the wind because you have to have the, it uncovered at night and so forth. You'll hear a funny story about that a little bit later. When the photons hit the focal plane, you can collect them with your eye, which none of us do anymore, or you can collect them with some kind of a photoelectric, now photoelectric detector. Uh, rockets are a big piece of this. Rockets came from World War II. I'll mention that, but I won't talk about it too much. And then I will close with uh, some comments about computers, which certainly didn't come from astronomy. They came from you all who are buying Kindles and TI, TR-80s and TRS-80s. Anybody ever buy a TRS-80 in this room beside me? Yeah, see? So astronomy, of course, has been around for many years. Uh, the ancient Chinese were the masters of keeping records, and these are just sketches of comets. Uh, you don't see many naked eye comets uh, particularly because of the lights, but in the last few years there have actually been three of them which are pretty spectacular. If you watch them over a period of time, the tails, the dust tails, develop into many different shapes, and all this is depicted in these ancient uh, Chinese drawings. I think there are about a thousand ancient objects that are in the catalogs. Um, astronomy was done completely by eye, um, and there was one basic rule, one basic view of looking uh, at the nature of the universe in the Western world, that is in Europe, and anybody who contacted Europe. And uh, that was a view that the planets went around the Earth and the sun goes around the Earth and so forth. Um, you all know that story. But in, 16, in 1542, 1543, when the Sistine Chapel was painted by Michelangelo, just finished actually, just before Copernicus died, uh, Copernicus had a simpler way of looking at things uh, but he couldn't talk about it while he was alive because of fear of repression. He was a priest, and it didn't, his ideas didn't agree with those of the church. You all know this story, probably. Um, but I, give, I like to show this picture because it dates in history when this is, right? Michelangelo was kind of way back there. You all know that. It's the way you think about it, probably. Uh, after Copernicus, there was a famous astronomer about 75, 60 years later named Tycho Brahe, who was, became an uh, excellent observer just by uh, using rods and sticks. So the, this instrument is in the uh, Beijing Observatory in, uh, in uh, Beijing, China. Now all the instruments have some kind of a sighting device along them, a little tube on one end, a tube on the other end, and you look through it and you can get the positions of stars and, and so forth and so on. The ironic thing is that this was actually installed. This is the one that was installed in 1672-1673 by the Jesuit priests in China, 70 years, 60 years after the telescope was invented, and they didn't have a telescope in that observatory, a point that you will understand in just a few minutes. In 1608, it's said that uh, Hans uh, Lipperhey uh, accidentally probably invented the telescope by just having two pieces of optics which somehow got held up in front of him. There's a lot of lore around this. Some people say that other people did it. He was just one of many. Uh, and it's even said that a little girl was in his lab playing with his optics and just happened to, you know, do this and hold them in the right place. And Hans was very interested in this. Mm, I think that might have some applications. And he promptly went to get it patented uh, so he could sell telescopes to the military because Spain was at war with Spain. And you're going to hear this theme again repeated, that the military uh, uses of telescopes have had a huge impact on our ability to build telescopes. Turns out there are only two places in the world where uh, optics of a high enough quality could be made in those days. One is uh, Murano in Italy, and one is Middleburg in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Um, his patent was denied because it took so long to consider it that they were soon all over, the, all over Europe. You could buy them in the marketplaces in the street, and the, uh, the officials didn't think it was worth a patent. And so therefore, Galileo heard about it very quickly, and by June, I think, of 1609, he had improved upon uh, Hans, Hans Lipperhey's telescope. His is on the left. Um, this is in, the vin the, uh, in the Venice, or Florence, rather, in Italy, in the museum there. The one on the other side is the Galilean telescope, and uh, for the next 200 years, 
uh, Galilean telescope, sorry, the Newtonian telescope. It's a reflector. It's got a little mirror at the back instead of just having light coming through optics. For 200 years, things went back and forth about whether the reflector was better than the refractor, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Galileo did something with his telescope. Newton did nothing, as far as I can tell, with his telescope. So a good idea, of course, is not very good unless it's actually used for something. Now, the optics was very poor. Uh, this is the picture of a front end of this telescope taken by Owen uh, Gingrich uh, in the Florence Museum. Um, and this is what I call a very powerful factor of two. So the telescope is maybe between one and two inches in diameter when you look at it. It has an objective, a, a piece of transmitting glass at the front. And uh, the optics couldn't be polished well enough to get an, uh, uh, a nice image. It was very uh, disturbed, if you will. So you could only use the central part of the glass. You couldn't use the edges of it. And so it was stopped down with this little white ring. So this is what I call the a uh, very, very powerful factor of two. Your eye is seven centimeters when it's dilated, and this telescope's only about uh, twice that linear size. And with it, Galileo literally changed the world. The first, one of the first things he did was to look at the moon, and uh, these sketches, there are six sketches left in the museum in Florence, still surviving. Uh, lots of interesting stories about these sketches because he didn't actually draw what he saw. He, draw, he drew what he wanted to see, these aren't taken, at the, I mean, you couldn't get these drawings on the dates that he got them because of the phase of the moon and so forth. But you can see in the orange picture on the right, uh, these little horns, two mountain ranges, two little horns that invade into the dark side. And this is what, this was Galileo's great insight, that the surface of the moon had mountains on it. Now, uh, because, so that even when the sun wasn't reaching one side of the moon, when the sunlight wasn't reaching inside the moon, the mountains were sticking up and catching it and reflecting it uh, towards Earth. It turns out other people were onto the, onto the moon with telescopes, but they didn't have Galileo's insights. It's an amazing story. Galileo was a Renaissance man. It's a perfect argument for a liberal arts education. Uh, physicists, engineers who were looking at the moon, didn't pick this up. They were trying to get details of the shapes and like you were surveying a country or something like that. But Galileo was a painter and he knew about something called chiaroscuro uh, in the Rembrandt paintings. You see a lot of this. It's just simply the use of shadows to get perspective uh, in pictures. So he was all prepared for this discovery. His mind was there. Galileo discovered the craters on the moon. He discovered the sunspots, which I said went away a few years later. If he'd waited a little bit longer, he wouldn't have found them. He saw that the Milky Way broke up into many, many stars. He discovered the moons of Jupiter, found the dog ears on Saturn, which we know as the rings, saw the phases of Venus. Uh, those are the positive things. On the negative side, he knew that um, to discount the past theories, he was going to have to show that the stars have a parallax. Now, if you don't know what a parallax is, just hold your finger up against the, so you can see it projected on the screen and then blink your eyes back and forth. Okay? And you'll see that your finger appears to move. When I do it, I see a head occulted, and then when I uncover my other eye, another head's occulted. If you bring the finger up and blink your eyes, you'll see that the effect goes over a large angle. Your finger really moves a long way. And if you hold it far away and do it, uh, you'll see that the effect isn't quite so big. As the Earth goes around the sun and you look at a star from one side of the sun and then the other side, the stars appear to move, the nearby stars. Uh, given all the, the thoughts of the day, there had to be a very large parallax if Copernicus was right that the Earth went around the sun. Galileo was absolutely certain that Copernicus was right, but he couldn't prove it, and that's the main point. Um, we were talking at dinner, I forget who said it, but uh, according to the uh, biblical scholars who were uh, running the Catholic Church, the earth shall not be moved. And the Jesuits refused to let the Catholic Church or anybody in the Catholic Church uh, uh, believe such a thing. Now, the other thing, they didn't really know how big the stars were, right? and therefore how far away they were, and in fact, whether they were even like the sun. So Tycho, who was the great astronomer of the time, 
made certain assumptions. He made the 